So thanks very much, everybody, for coming along uh, on what is actually quite a sunny afternoon, at least where I am. Uh, so thank you for kind of sacrificing um, an hour's worth of sun in order to listen to me talk about uh, ephemera. And uh, the title of the lecture, as you can see there, is Recycling from the Dustbin of History. Uh, ephemera. Now, I should explain what ephemera are. Oh, actually, before that, even I should tell you exactly what I'm going to be covering. There's not really a story here. There's a, it's a, a more of a series of vignettes. Um, and so what I'm trying to get across uh, is not so much a, you know, a, a chronological history of the early 20th century, indeed far from it. Uh, instead, I'm, I'm going to look at some individual types of evidence and types of documents and sources um, and explain how a historian would look at them now and what the sorts of things that historians can get out of them, which might not be immediately obvious. So as I say, this is going to come across as like a, a series of, of little uh, shrapnel um, snapshots, if you like, of uh, the the things that I'm going to, to look at. But uh, ephemera, what is ephemera? Well, ephemera are objects that, when they were produced, were not intended to last a long time. Uh, or they were specially produced for one particular occasion. Um, and that includes pretty much everything that, that, is, that is disposable. So that's why the, the title is Recycling from the Dustbin, because these are things that are generally speaking thrown away quite a lot, or at least only last a very short, short amount of time. Um, more for entertainment purposes or, or something of that nature. So it includes things like uh, tickets and posters, packaging, calling cards, um, novelty items, badges, postage stamps, leaflets, and the three things that I'm going to look at uh, today, which are postcards, advertisements, and the third one is a, is a little bit cheeky on my part because it's not a, a material object per se, um, but it is nonetheless kind of part of a, a throwaway culture, if you like, and that is music hall and popular song. And hopefully you've already downloaded the song sheets. If you haven't yet, you can click on that little box underneath the, the chat area. And uh, if you click on the directly onto that um, uh, PDF, um, then you can download that and so you'll be able to listen to what I'm uh, going to be um, talking about as we go through. So um, I've chosen these these three because, well, uh, all ephemera in one way or another reveal things unintentionally, really, about the past, but I've chosen these three um, because they are they're good at revealing the ways in which people lived. Uh, and by the way, by that, I mean the ordinary kind of humdrum everyday stuff that people did. And that's really important for, for local history, certainly for national history, too, um, because it will give you a sense of context. It give you a sense of how things knitted together on a, you know, on a practical basis day to day. So it's about how people what, um, what they wore, what they ate, what they drank. Um, how they felt about love or sexual attraction, how they felt about faith, politics, family, where they worked, uh, what they feared, what they celebrated, and what they found funny and what they thought was serious. So it's those types of things. It's those everyday commonplace um, uh, tropes, if you like, that, that we'll be looking at in the uh, next few slides. Um, by tropes, I mean uh, the kind of recognized um, commonplace conventions in text um, or in speech, uh, sometimes puns, uh, sometimes slogans, um, sometimes visual symbols, but things that, that were Properly understood, properly conceived, needed no explanation for uh, their presence within a particular source. And because they needed no explanation, they actually reveal quite a bit about the past as it was lived, because this is the, the, the kind of cultural wraparound context in which everyday activities are carried out. 
Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is to play you a song. Um, this is what it is. It's going to be, he'd have to get under, um, and the recording is by Billy Murray from 1913. The song's a little bit older than that, and the song is written by um, uh, American um, writing uh, combo, uh, but it, it was extraordinarily popular in, in Britain. So that's what I'm going to play you first. And I want you to kind of clear your mind of anything that you already know about the world and specifically the UK um, prior to, in the years immediately prior to the First World War. And then in the light of that, I'd like you to think about what is in this song, which kind of unintentionally, incidentally reveals things about that period, that period in the um, uh, the years leading up to the outbreak of the First World War. So here we go. Hopefully this will work. This is a, an audiovisual marvel, I hope. Um, and hold on to your hats, everybody. <laughs> O'Connor bought an automobile. He took his sweetheart for a ride one Sunday. Johnny was togged up in his best Sunday clothes. She nestled close to his side. Things went just dandy till he got down the road. Then something happened to the old machinery. That engine got his goat, off went his hat and coat. Everything needed repairs. He'd have to get under, get out and get under, to fix his little machine. He was just dying to cuddle his queen. But every minute, when he'd begin it, he'd have to get under, get out and get under. Then he'd get back at the wheel. A dozen times they'd start to hug and kiss, and then the darned old engine, it would miss, and then he'd have to get under, get out and get under, and fix up his automobile. Millionaire Wilson said to Johnny one day, your little sweetheart don't appreciate you. I have a daughter who is hungry for love. She likes to ride every day. Johnny had visions of a million in gold. He took her riding in his little auto. But every time that he went to say marry me, it was the old story again. He'd have to get under, get out and get under, to fix his little machine. He was just dying to cuddle his queen, but every minute, when he'd begin it, he'd have to get under, get out and get under, then he'd get back at the wheel. Every time that he would reach for a kiss, it seems that darn old spark plug. It would miss, and then he'd have to get under, get out and get under, and fix up his automobile. He'd have to get under, get out and get under, to fix his little machine. He was just dying to puzzle his queen, but every minute... When he'd begin it, he'd have to get under, get out and get under. Then he'd get back at the wheel. It seems that once she sat down on his knee and then he lost control. Ran right up the tree and then he had to get under, get out and get under. And fix up his automobile. Well, there we go. Billy Murray from 1913, although, as I say, the song is slightly older than that, and um, uh, he'd have to get under. So, okay, 
what can that tell us about um, society in the immediate pre-war years if you if you didn't know anything particularly about that type of society now we know that this is a this is a very popular song and actually there's a there's a source a little bit further on which i'll which i'll kind of show you how how popular it was um so what we can find out is well okay commercially produced cars existed if we knew nothing at all i mean this is probably very common knowledge but if you didn't know that then you would this this would tell you that commercially produced cars existed um and obviously within the financial reach of the reasonably well off not just the super rich the <clears throat> okay this is an american song but still it had a, had a quite a big cachet uh, in the uk too as well uh so you've got the super rich which is the millionaire um who who kind of like proffers his daughter to this this young um <laughs> presumably roguish character uh johnny um but it's, but it's johnny who owns who owns the car so um this is uh that's quite uh, interesting that that is it is within the reach of um almost like the next layer down from the from the the, the plutocrats if you like at the top um and uh but they weren't very reliable that's so this wouldn't be a, a comic song it wouldn't have had the the kind of the kind of reach that it did have if it wasn't for for the fact that this is this is a commonly understood trope that cars though they existed were not very re reliable and um uh, it also incidentally reveals things about uh the uh, the way in which people conducted their leisure time. So Sunday here uh, appears to become, be becoming a day of leisure, at least for some people. Uh, it might be an indication of ongoing secularization. Sometimes with these these sources, it's just a question of of them suggesting angles and questions that you could then go and follow up through looking at, at, at other sources as well in order to get a more complete picture. But that's one of the, the beauties of ephemera because it does give you that that sense of, of potential questions that you might want to to ask. Um, there are sartorial details in the uh, in the song's lyrics that he's he's wearing his 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 Sunday best. He's togged up in his hat and coat and so forth. Um, these are clearly unchaperoned excursions now does that uh, indicate a, an increasing sexual i use that in inverted commas really uh, increasing sexual license certainly um a mixing between the between the sexes which is not kind of governed by um sort of outside parental or at least uh, uh matriarchal patriarchal forces <laughs> in some way and um are these stereotype? Well, of course they're stereotype characters. You know, but Johnny is the kind of like the the the, the Johnny come lately, uh, quite literally, um, and uh, the the millionaire and and the 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 ladies themselves are also kind of stereotyped characters. But that's what makes it funny, of course, um, for for the people of the time. Uh, and there is a, there is a moral as well. You know, before as as Johnny gets presumably too excited and he drives his car into a tree. Curiously enough, there are other versions of this that didn't make it, uh, weren't recorded, didn't make it onto, um, uh, well, I was going to say vinyl, but it's not vinyl, it's shellac. Um, it didn't make it onto onto record, um, which were the stuff that would have been um, delivered on stage, uh, where actually the lyrics are, are a little nearer the knuckle than the, than this. So there's... there's kind of euphemisms of, of uh, uh, cars jerking and, and and various other things, which uh, are potentially a, a little more euphemistic. OK, so I give you that just to show you how even if you know nothing about a, a period, then just something as simple as that, which which seems to be a, a, a kind of a throwaway piece of, of culture. Can that still tell us stuff about the past? Um, <laughs> you're quite right, Alan. Uh, Music Hall was not noted for setting a moral standard, if anything, <laughs> quite the reverse. OK, so uh, I'm going to come back and we're going we're to do some more. Uh, look at a couple of other examples of uh, Music Hall um, uh, skits, if you like, a little bit later in, in the presentation. But that's just to kind of get us started with the idea of, of what ephemera can, 
can um, reveal to us. Um, so the next genre I'm going to look at is postcards. Postcards were were incredibly popular in the from the sort of last decade of uh, of the Victorian period through the Edwardian period and, and into the interwar years. They start to sort of tail off in terms of popularity in the the uh, the 1930s 40s. Um, but for a, a sh that short period of time, that maybe that 30 40 year span, postcards are um, just almost like a, the the social media of their of their day. First of all, that they are they're cheap to buy and cheap to send. Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you uh, the the prices in a second. Um, but they are uh, well within the reach of of um, pretty much any, anybody who isn't absolutely stony broke. Um, they are widely available, so they're sold pretty much everywhere. So it's a form of mass communication, and there are several postal deliveries a day. Now, I've had students uh, in the past, and uh, maybe one or two of you are, are, are similar as well, who, who actually collect postcards and have said to me, oh, yes, this actually rings a bell, because I've got postcards which say, I'll meet you off the train tonight or something like that. So indicating that, you know, certainly over short distances within a city or a, a county or something like that, you could post a, a postcard first thing in the morning and it will still be delivered because there will be a, at least a second post. And in some of uh, some of the bigger cities, there were even three posts uh, a, a day. So th this is this is like an email in, in, in a sense, um, in terms of or as, as fast as it possibly uh, could be for in the uh, Edwardian period as well. Um, they are privately produced. They are privately produced for profit. That makes them more valuable for uh, historians, not less, um, uh, because, of course, a private producer needs to appeal to his or her audience. And if they are um, If, sorry, if they have a uh, a postcard that isn't very popular, it's relatively easy just to, to pull it back in and um, pulp it, really. Um, so, uh, generally speaking, actually, let's skip forward a, a couple of points there. Their value diminishes with their rarity. Value to historians, that is, not value to postcard collectors. It's exactly the opposite for postcard collectors. Um, the ones which we're interested in as historians, which will tell us the most about the past, are the ones which are kind of the, there are lots of them. Um, uh, those that that were rare were not generally speaking very popular because there's just few of them are, are, were sent and therefore there are fewer of them are, are around today. Um, but those that were sent a lot. Uh, will have been popular for you know, whatever reason. That might be because they were particularly comedic or they were particularly nice views or whatever it might have been. Um, uh, so that is, that's quite interesting. I've got most of the examples that are in the um, slides that are going uh, to follow this from postcard auction sites. And uh, postcard auction sites are kind of revealing in that in that way because they will tell you something about the value of, of the source of the individual postcard. If I see a postcard on there, I haven't put any in that were kind of going for sort of upwards of um, eight, nine, ten quid, and there are some like that. Um, but uh, those that are just going for a, for a, you know a two or three pounds uh, um, are the ones that are like, like to be more common and therefore more useful for a historian. Um, they are they're off they are full of shared cultural references and there will be a couple of examples of, of that in the uh, the slides that follow and they are used uh, to get a message out of a variety of variety kinds really um, charities use them political causes use them there's there's an enormous number of, of both pro and anti suffragette um postcards for for example in the sort of five or six years before the outbreak of the the first world war states use them particularly during uh, times of crisis and wartime and, and and so forth um but they're less important than than uh, kind of like private 
uh, bodies or bodies out in civil society like charities uh, and of course advertisers use them extensively as well um, to, can give them away because uh, they're relatively cheap to uh, to produce and and hopefully they'll be uh, they'll be sent on um, by uh, the users you know people who are trying to com just communicate to, between themselves and they will reflect the art and design that is popular at the time not necessarily that is best or is considered to be artistically worthy but it will it will show changes in uh in art and design over time okay so let's actually have a look at some of these um this is the back of a, of a postcard this is what i was saying about how cheap they were really um so uh, really interesting here that um if there's any writing beyond the sender's name and address and a greeting of five words, a penny stamp must be used. You can see that there. Um, and otherwise, a half penny stamp is sufficient. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we have Wish You Were Here as a, um, a, a kind of greeting from Seaside or holidays or whatever it might be um or even having a lovely time there you go that's that's your that's your your four words and then your name there you go and that's that's your five that's your five words so that that costs you half as much as writing even one more word than that um and it's also why they are uh, they they can be used like emails or texts or something like that to send a very very brief message about a uh, a particular event or a meeting or something like that. Uh, so uh, that I'll give you that purely to show you the kind of uh, environment in which uh, postcards uh, acquire their, their their popularity, and a lot of that is is down to them being just phenomenally inexpensive. Okay, so here's a, a something a, a little bit more, uh, perhaps a little bit more interesting. It's a postcard of Brighton Aquarium. This is this is near where I live. Uh, from 1907 and I show you this um, really just to, to give you an idea of the uh, the types of sartorial uh, setup that uh, most people had in those days you will see that most of the men there are are wearing hats you can see um, what what was uh, presumably at the time a relatively modern baby carriage there a pram there and you can see uh, women out and about as well uh, you can see the, the architecture uh, at Brighton as it was at the time. Now, you might well say, well, you could get that from, from a, a photograph um, of, of any type. And the only difference between that photograph and a postcard here uh, is because it's the, um, the photos that were thought to be um, sufficiently kind of attractive that were then made into, into postcards. Uh, and would have had a wide distribution. So it's uh, it's like a photograph, like times a dozen, really, in terms of its reach and in terms of its importance in uh, revealing things about about the past. This I wasn't entirely sure that was about what that was 1907. That was just a just a a kind of an educated guess, uh, really. Uh, this one I know exactly when it was it was from. It's from it is from 1910 it's actually from april 1910 and I, this wasn't um uh this wasn't mentioned on the on the site that i got it this is one of the ones i got from a, a postcard uh auction site um but i can tell that's from from 1910 because it refers to a very specific I incident that occurs in in april 1910 which is the arrival of halley's comet um, and uh, so here you've got the, the, the gentleman with the uh, enormous kind of glowing nose, if you like, uh, sort of typical grotesque here. Um, and the, the kind of working class Joe is, is being uh, uh, shocked by uh, the arrival of this, uh, this chap's nose around the corner there. Um, the, there was a, a little bit of a, a moral panic around the, uh, the arrival of Halley's Comet because there was a, a fear that it would pass uh, it, through the Earth's atmosphere and cause various sort of uh, bad effects, which of course didn't happen. But um, but that is something that is that is kind of really uh, you can you can see exactly where that's situated in time. This particular postcard. This isn't this isn't going to be sold at, at um, uh, in any great numbers um, post April nineteen ten. 
And in the postcard itself, you can see, and I talked about tropes earlier on, which are these kind of conventional, commonplace um, visual and um, <laughs> word images, which everybody uh, would have understood, even if they are kind of exaggerated. There's, there's, uh, this is a, a this is a toff, obviously, on the left hand side with the the luminous nose, um, with the top hat and the and the walking cane and all the and and so on and so forth. A, a grotesque an exaggeration, of course, of what a a toff an upper class uh, gentleman looked like, but nonetheless something that's easily and readily recognisable. Likewise, uh, the working class chap there has got a pipe. Uh, he's he's got a bowler hat. He's got the you know the the kind of the waistcoat and the donkey jacket and all the sort of things that you would associate with a a working class Joe. Um, so these kinds of tropes are, are repeated endlessly in in uh, certainly in comic postcards, uh, and they kind of reveal what uh, what was common, what was commonly understood amongst the uh, the recipients of, of these uh, of these postcards. Okay. Um, now, war uh, is actually a, produces a, a great, uh, ev even greater sort of um, mushrooming of of postcards because you, you get a lot of um, traffic to and from uh, the front, particularly in, from the UK and and to the the front in in Belgium, France. Um, and they are often, uh, certainly in the early stages of the war, they were often comic and uh, propagandistic as well. So um, these, this one, first one here is, uh, this is obviously the Kaiser, as you can see. Uh, in his uh, in his pajamas as a as a depicted as a child uh, and a, a, a little little nudge there it's a little um, uh, slightly naughty phrase Willie with a bear behind of course unfortunately the bear's nose has been rubbed off on this on this postcard but um, but nonetheless the, the bear obviously representing uh, the problems that the uh, German forces would have in uh, their uh, assault on Russia, um, but you can see the the, the kind of humour there. Um, Trivialising one's enemy is extremely po is extremely common in uh, in propaganda and in these kinds of, of postcards, which are so which are sent in, as I say, in great numbers. Um, not just domestically, but of course between um, those fighting and uh, those who remain on the on the home front. You can see a similar sort of thing uh, in the second uh, postcard here. And again, this is again this is the Kaiser um, represented as a as a Frankfurter, um, a Frank a Frankfurter who's fishing there. And you can see that uh, over the uh, the fence of the county asylum um is a is one of the the inmates one of the patients there if you can't read what it says below i'll just give you a, a clue it says idiot uh, that's obviously the uh the patient at the asylum the idiot says hello sausage what are you fishing for uh, to which the sausage uh, the kaiser replies the world and the idiot then says come inside so again that kind of ridiculing of of one's uh, opponents uh, and the depiction of them as um, humorous grotesques uh, is is kind of good for morale. Uh, you'll see a very similar sort of thing, although this, there are there are not quite as many kind of grotesques uh, here. The the German uh, soldiers are, are depicted in a far more grotesque and comic clownish way than the allies and you can see that the different uh, allies there uh, are all coming to um, uh, support Europe and roll the ball backwards across the um, uh, the the German troops one of whom is fleeing in the background as you can see there you've got the obviously the British the French the Russians the um, Scots and so forth uh, and they're all they're all drawn as uh, 
quite conventionally uh, and not at all in the uh, in, in a comedic way but the germans the germans are um so belittling one's enemy is is uh, fairly obvious uh, from this. And it, of course, there's a bit of bombast about this. And, and clearly, this is a piece of, of propaganda. Um, here's it. This is the, what's interested me uh, the most. And this is why I put this in is because it reinforces what uh, I was saying two or three slides back when we listened to the uh, the Billy Murray song, which um, the the German uh, uh, army there is saying, Hock, but, but this do make us sweat. And the reply from the allies there, ah, but you'll get hotter yet, get out or you'll get under. Now, that reinforces the, uh, uh, the, the value, if you like, of, of, the, of the earlier song. This is a, a, a comic trope or a comic um, uh, reference back to a different cultural product. So that's that kind of interweaving of, of different types of, of source there, which show that the, the value of them by their repetition in other media. Um, I should, of course, point out that the, the propaganda here, this is, again, this is privately produced postcards. These aren't, this isn't something that's being, being churned out, at least in the, the cases I've already shown you. This isn't being churned out by the, by the state as, um, uh, as an attempt to kind, kind of uh, enforce a state line or, or encourage a state line. This is private propaganda. This is what was considered at the time um, by the by the postcard manufacturing companies that would have a, a level of cachet uh, which would sell more postcards as well as obviously um, uh, dishing the the opposition there. Um, moving on to the sorry I just had to mute somebody's microphone there my apologies uh, Okay, so uh, moving to the the end of the uh, of the First World War, this is uh, uh, and uh, okay, this is this is mildly comic, um, and it's a <clears throat> French postcard from nineteen nineteen. Uh, it's it, uh, the reason I'm giving you this is because it shows the way in which um political pressure groups were also using postcards to get uh the, a, a message out um and of course it plays on the, the 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 themes of war but it but it's it has a serious intent as well uh no rest no rest for the uh for the old boys work for repopulation this is the the message at the top of the card there you probably maybe not be able to see what the um the writing is towards the the bottom left but essentially uh that is take a pin uh, close your eyes and wave it over the postcard and then and then prick it in at at random and that that gentlemen that is your uh, that is your destiny <laughs> so you know you can't escape it if you're uh, uh, an old um, an old veteran uh, it's it's going to be romance of one kind or another and of course uh, um, uh, babies if uh, at the bottom uh, right hand corner there um, this is produced by the uh, the national association for growing the french population it's a it was a kind of a pro-natal group, uh, which was uh, in existence prior to the outbreak of the First World War, but it's given this kind of enormous uh, fillip by the First World War, largely because of the high casualty rate. Um, and uh, it's very it's very strong. Uh, it's the, the largest uh, a group of its kind in, in, in France, um, something in the region of about half a million members um in the immediate post-war period so that's an example of, of a, a kind of pressure group propaganda if you like encouraging uh, uh french uh, soldiers to to get married and um uh you know burgeon the population um and then the last one i'm going to look at uh is uh well of course um you'll all be familiar i'm sure with the, the name donald mcgill or at least familiar with his work this is a 
he's the kind of godfather of the, sea, of the saucy seaside postcard, as I say there. <laughs> um, I've chosen one that's one of the one of the uh, least offensive <laughs> that I could find, but it's still kind of revealing about uh the uh the commonplace sort of memes if you like of 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 the day uh so the the child they're slightly uh, um anxious and uh, and uh, scared of her of her father's um get up there is daddy going to a fancy dress mummy no dear but we're at the seaside now you know um this is kind of indicative of the way in which the seaside was seen as holidays in general as seen as uh, something kind of outside of normal uh, quotidian existence um, and could uh, permit this this license this extra kind of um, uh, freedom to to be a little bit uh, kind of wacky with the uh, the, the guy there with a, a, a kind of a, a striped um, blazer and uh, a little boater smoking a, smoking a, what appears to be a cigar um, plus fours and and, and so forth um, so yes kind, kind of looking ridiculous uh, and deliberately so but um, again if this is um, shows the uh, the way in which again a grotesque but it shows the way in which um seaside was seen or holidays were seen as, as some of a what uh, some historians would call a liminal space that is it's it's not part of it's the, at the limit of uh, normal existence it's outside of the um the normal everyday uh, experience there Okay, um, and of course it's um, seaside uh, postcards uh, sent from the seaside. Are the, are the thing it's the thing that hold that holds on much longer, much uh, much past uh, when postcards start to decline. If they uh, probably thirties, forties, they start to decline, but they hold on and are still terrifically strong, as we all know, I'm sure, um, well into the into the late twentieth century as something that that is sent from the seaside is kind of associated with this this uh, the entertainment and joy and uh and uh and laughter and something that's a bit different from the everyday humdrum okay so that's postcards for you and those are some of the things you can get uh, from postcards uh and I, as i say i've given you those examples to show you the types of things that you can get from them, which might suggest other questions, might suggest other avenues to to look at uh, if you're interested in in doing research, rather than um, portraying a, a a single line of uh, of narrative. Um, uh, now, advertisements, which have a kind of a very similar sort of uh, feel to them in in some ways, um, uh, they have uh, like the like postcards uh they are kind of obviously going to be privately produced because they are um that's that's what they're they're doing they're commercial they have to persuade their audience to buy a product or engage a service um and so because they they, they have to persuade their audience they will try to appeal to their audience as much as they possibly can and that may be that they are appealing to an audience's aspirations not so much um their uh their kind of everyday basic needs so this the the You'll see that even in relatively humdrum products, you'll see that that, that um, advertisers, on the whole, we see it today, of course, uh, still trying to invest those products with with um, a little more with more glamour and a little more aspiration than than uh, perhaps that they that they warrant. And this is one of the reasons why the advertising industry is, generally speaking, has a bit of a bad name <laughs> um, because they kind of oversell things. But for a historian, that's it, that's really useful. As long as you know that, uh, then it's really useful to kind of reveal people's um, the sorts of things that people might be striving for, might be aspiring to. Uh, they come in a variety of, of media. The uh, all but one of what I'm about to show you uh, are um, are in press or journals or you know so they're they're in uh, they're printed adverts but there are do come in a variety of other uh, media I've already said the postcards are, are used quite extensively for 
for advertising um and you also get those those kind of posters or metal plates um which have have adverts uh on them which are which were affixed in shops and pubs and all, and, and the such like so uh kind of quite permanent uh adverts they tend to be a bit you know posher and you know better produced uh but advertise uh advertisers use a whole variety of media in order to kind of get their their products out there, so to speak, uh, they tend to reflect social norms. And the reason they tend to reflect social norms in one way or another is because one doesn't want to alienate or antagonize one's audience. One wants the audience to kind of lean in in the, in the current jargon um, rather than to be kind of repulsed uh, by it. So it will tend to re re reinforce the kinds of tropes um, not comedic, as in well, as we saw with the postcards, um, but it will reinforce the, reinforce the kind of, of, of tropes that are um, most people will will understand and will accept. Uh, they are more, rather more than, than postcards in some ways. They are tend to be reflective contemporary art and design because there's a, there's a uh, there's a certain cachet about looking modern and up to date and right at the cutting edge, and as with um, as with postcards, their value diminishes with rarity. If it's just an advert that appears once in one magazine, then it's probably uh, I mean it might be interesting on, on its uh, uh, on its own terms, but but it's probably not going to be terrifically useful in terms of the weight of evidence that might be kind of derived from that. Whereas if it's an advertising campaign that runs for several months or even years in some cases, um, then that uh, gets a uh, that becomes more valuable to the historian in terms of the evidence that you can <coughs> legitimately de derive from it. OK, so this is uh, this is the only one that is that is not a print um, advert. This is Britannia rules the waves in the 1890s. And it's also with the, my one concession for kind of stepping outside of the 20th century. But I just thought it was it was really good. There you go. Um, and you can see from that um, uh, Britannia rules the wave, but ocean wave baking powder rules the cooking world. Um, this is, as I say, pretty much archetypal of, of something that is a really kind of a very everyday product, uh, trying to invest itself with a little bit of glamour by associating itself both with uh, both with royalty, a surprisingly young looking Queen Victoria there um, from the, this is supposed to be in the 1890s, what well, is in the 1890s. Um, uh, so there's a glamour of of royalty. There's also the kind of the martial spirit, I suppose, of of um, of the of the navy uh, and kind of implicitly the the uh, the um, the the glory in inverted commas of of uh, of empire. Um, and the, the this humble uh, baking powder is is uh, trying to. Um, or its advertisers are trying to to associate itself with uh, these um, uh, these images, which which had a, a, a certain amount of cultural cachet. Also, notice here I want to talk about sort of art and design. That this uh, that's that's kind of very modern looking uh, for the time. Uh, art nouveau ish um, uh, kind of braiding of uh, um, a well, it could be ivy. Anyway, it's certainly something organic um, around the the profile of the queen. There. Um, now, this is as something. Technology is also something that, that sells um, enormously. It has a a, a real sense that um, if you can associate your your product with technology, if your product is technologically cutting edge, then that is uh, generally speaking uh, something that, that that most commercial companies want to be heavily associated with. So this is technology and progress in, in Imperial Russia. Now, at first glance, of course, that looks like a row of telegraph poles, which of course uh, is um, tremendously. Um, Progressive with a small p uh, at, uh, at the time in Imperial Russia, but a closer examination of that will will show you that in fact this is um, 
an advert for cigarettes. Um, this is Biss Cigarettes from 1909. And so despite the fact that, that Russia was you know, very, you know, electricity, very poorly uh, uh, electrified until um, until the Bolsheviks came along and kind of forced everybody to adopt it. Um, uh, the uh, the cachet that comes with associating um, a product like cigarettes with um, technological advance as uh, is pretty clear from that picture. Uh, war's terrible effects on hair, how war impoverishes the nation's hair. Just like war uh, gives a, a enormous boost to the postcard industry, it also become it's a, it's a wonderful thing uh, for advertisers because they can pretty much relate anything, of, if they can, they'll try and relate as much as they possibly can of their, their, their uh, product, or at least they're selling, um, to, uh, to wartime. So uh, this is a, a quite a, a long, you would probably call this an, an, an advertorial rather than a, the, these days. Or um, uh, And uh, this is from the, the Illustrated London News. Some of the things we can pick up from this are not so much about the product itself, but you can see uh, what's fashionable in terms of hair, uh, in terms of hairstyles. Uh, you can also, uh, not that you can read this text because I'm sure it's too small, but there, there is there is quite a lot of stuff in there which is a kind of um, semi-scientific or, or pseudo-scientific in the way in which it explains things. And you will also see in the centre there, and this is the main reason why I, I chose it, uh, other than the fact that it, it seems you know, <laughs> a piece of terrific sort of bathos to be uh, um, trying to sell uh, what, is this, what is at root a shampoo on the basis of uh, it's uh, the way in which you can help with the worries of war. Um, is that picture in the middle there now if you uh, hopefully you can see roughly what that is and it's it's one of um something that's becoming relatively popular in the uh, relatively common rather in the period from the kind of late victorian peri period through to the uh well, where we are now in the, in the first world war and that is a a scientific diagram um and on the left hand side is is the weak uh hair and it's and it's it's weedy follicle and on the uh on the right hand side is is the strong hair after obviously it's it's treatment um with this uh magnificent uh product which is called harleen believe it or not um so uh the uh i'll give you that to 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 show you how these these kind of scientific or scientific looking diagrams which are really relatively common now and you see them all the time for hair products and skin products and you know, even pet food and that that sort of thing um in, in adverts today that that's that's not a recent thing at all this is this goes all the way back to uh, the beginning of, of the 20th century and this is uh, something that is uh, considered at the time by advertisers to be uh, a, a good seller Okay. Um, when we get to the nineteen, uh, well, the nineteen twenties and thirties, I'm giving you these um, to show both the the kind of the progress that is at least ostensibly being made by women, but also the limits of that progress here. Uh, here, so business girls. Okay, so the the fact that that. Um, a woman is being pictured in a, in a clerical uh, or administrative type of uh, occupation on the left hand side there uh, is in itself kind of a, uh, a, a win in inverted commas for, for women. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, the, these uh, it's, it's still being used to 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 sell what is essentially kind of like uh, ointment and, and talcum powder. Um, yeah. <laughs> Do they have celebrity endorsements? Uh, the yes, the, quite often you have celebrity ad endorsements in, in in adverts. In fact, actually, the one on the the right hand side, there is a kind of uh, celebrity uh, in endorsement, Alan. Um, uh, 
which again is uh, uh, aimed at the modern women the modern woman plan your kitchen to save your legs at the beginning of ergonomics here and it is this is promoting gas uh gas showrooms which um were kind of springing up all over the all over the place in the in the interwar years particularly in in urban areas and that um the woman who's depicted there uh, darcy braddle is is um the ideal home exhibition expert you probably can't see that from the uh, because the, the type is quite small, um, but that's how she's described um, beneath the beneath her name there. And again, both of these things show um, women's uh, the beginnings of, of women's liberation. They show what uh, modern hairstyles and and uh, to some extent the kind of um, what people uh, were wearing uh at the time they also down here you can see a picture of of a of an idealized kitchen as well so that's that's quite revealing in in some ways but again this is aspirational it's idealized so it's not um necessarily in fact probably isn't how most people uh you know most people's kitchens were were laid out if they were lucky enough to have a separate kitchen because obviously quite a lot of working class people didn't uh this isn't um a, an advert that is designed to appeal to the average working class woman uh so they show a certain amount of kind of progress if you like for for uh, for women but they also very definitely show the limits of that progress as well so there is still um somewhat of a uh, a sort of patronizing attitude here towards uh women in these uh types of uh, environments um now this one is quite interesting uh this isn't from the uk at all um and uh, again it's it's cigarettes um I, I, this wasn't wasn't really deliberate on 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 my part you know to kind of like encourage uh smoking but nonetheless uh here it is uh, the reason i, I uh, give you this is because uh, this tends to surprise people when when i tell them that it's 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 a german advertisement and it's from 1937 so it's got a bang slap in the middle of the nazi period and yet here is a um a very modern looking woman um who is who is is smoking and they also got this this kind of vaguely sort of surrealist uh look to the to the what the juxtaposition of, of the different factors it's kind of a magritish um type of uh, feel to that to that advert and that's quite surprising perhaps if you if you're thinking of um the uh the nazi regime as this this kind of monolith which which essentially kind of, sort of crushes out all free expression um and uh and so forth and then the, then this advert is suggests that this is not quite as as uniform and as, as monolithic as as we might as we might imagine uh and then uh, oh again now we're into the the second world war and we're we're looking at um the again the way in which war is being used to sell something in this case it's being used to sell mars bars now i've given you this because this is i say <laughs> comically of course I, I said a mars a month which is basically what you what pretty much what you'd be allowed on on the sweet ration because in 1943 we are this is uh this is where the sugar ration that's about as much as it would have got you a mars a month um and um the so what they still need to advertise obviously the the company still needs to advertise um and it's competing against uh, other products in in a, in a limited market they're being limited by by the imposition of of rationing so how do you get around that how do you how do you sell to people well this is and so the reason i put this in there is not so much because of the pictures of of the you know the, the happy squad is although that that uh kind of reinforces what I was saying earlier on about, about war being used as a selling point for um, uh, for various different products. But because of the table there, this is uh, so this is the energy values of Mars. Uh, nowadays, we would, well, I'm sure they would shrink away from from showing how many calories were, were in a Mars bar. 
but here it's uh, saying a pound for ma pound it's much better to eat, to eat a mars bar than it is to drink a glass of milk or uh, eat an egg or uh, or even have a lamb chop um because calories are really important calories are calories are, are what people need in 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 wartime so this is um uh kind of selling on, on in a way that we wouldn't really expect and because that is kind of unintentional and kind of unwitting it will open up other uh, avenues of that we can we can look at and then lastly we have this um again this is this is german advertisement from uh, 1942 and which again is is uh, how the war can be used to promote even the most uh, kind of everyday of products, the, the Yoohoo glue, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, is uh, so. This is a uh, uh, German inventors. These are these kids here are the German inventors of the future. German inventors growing or developing uh, for the future Europe. That's that was what struck me as quite interesting. The future Europe, which is uh, very much kind of like a, couched in a, in a a tone. Um, and a type of language use that was very common in uh, in Nazi Germany during wartime, which is that this, you know, it was in the the, um, the victory for for the Nazis will bring about a new Europe. So that's something as a okay, right. So that is that is advertisements, um, and now uh, music hall and popular song. Um, and I'm going to play you some some more stuff in a, in a second, but I've also got one eye on the time, and I know that's um, kind of overrunning a bit here. Um, so, musical major leisure industry, generally speak, as with the other two two genres of source, it, the the songs, the skits, and so forth, they are reflective of society's concerns because one you know needs to pull in an audience really, um, and they show what public taste and humour was at the time uh likewise and as with the other two sources you will see or you will hear in a second some of the sort of positive um tropes and language that was, that was commonly understood at the time the audience is particularly uh, important um and what i'm going to play you are the two things that were recorded and because they're recorded um, it suggests that there is a kind of a wide cache and as a wide um, uh, audience for them. In other words, because recording is expensive uh, and um, not everybody has a, a gramophone. Um, it's uh, only the the songs and the skits and so forth that were that were likely to be popular, likely to sell enough to kind of recoup the value of recording were um, were, were put um, uh, well were recorded in the first place. Um, there's some censorship as well. Uh, you won't see that quite so much in the, the examples I'm I'm going to give you, but there is a certainly censorship of certainly self censorship. Um, in when you, you get the, the the movement of a of a particular song into a or into a recorded version, uh, and I've already mentioned that earlier on with that he'd have to have to get under that the 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 stage version of that was a little more euphemistic and a little nearer the knuckle than the recorded version, um, and so that's quite common with uh recorded versions of songs and also they, they'll they are um they show musical styles at the time so the first one i'm i'm, I'm going to play you um and you can find this on your song sheet where hopefully you've uh, you've downloaded and uh, this is this is from uh a chap called ernie main um uh, in and it's called Lloyd George's Beer. Um, I, I, I apologize in advance for this because it really is a, a bit of a, <laughs> not only is it not a very good recording, 
uh, or that's very revealing. Um, but it, it's also something that is likely to get stuck in your head for about 24 hours afterwards. But anyway, this is Lloyd George's beer and see what you make of this. I'm sure you could agree that that was uh, uh, in some ways quite painful um, but um, uh, I give you it because as I say because this is recorded it, it shows that this is something that is kind of um, very popular at the time um, it also reveals it, I think it's it's seen as kind of a, a safety valve as well it's 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 kind of a protest song about the way in which the government was watering down uh, the beer in fact actually that's um, the, the average ABV for uh, for beer in prior to the first world war is um something in the region of about sort of like six percent six or seven percent uh, and the average abv after uh the or during the the, the first world war and, and uh, thereafter uh, is uh, about three and a half four percent um so in fact what we what we drink or what we were were drinking for for most of the 20th century was actually lloyd george's beer if you were if you were a beer drinker um and the previous uh the, the previous strengths of, of beer was much much more powerful uh which is one of the reasons why the the government kind of stepped in to to uh to, to stop drunkenness at work and to aid the the war effort but there's a, a kind of a protest song uh you know in, in a in a fairly good humored way uh, against it 
Um, I'll pick out just a couple of other things from this because, it, again, the kind of revealing of, of the milieu, uh, the environment in which um, people were living and working at the time. Uh, he talks about, um, or rather he sings about, um, uh, have you read of it, seen what's said of it in the mirror and the mail? Um, he doesn't say the Times and the Telegraph. Okay, the Times and the Telegraph are not going to scan quite as well. Um, but... Uh, by using those papers, it, it kind of gives us a clue as to what it is, what are the types of media, types of press that that people are on the whole um, reading at the time. The, at least the audience for this particular song, which is going to be uh, on the whole, it's going to be um, working uh, class um, people, given that this is a, a music hall song. Uh, and the other thing that I would, that uh, kind of surprised me at, at, at the end, although there has been some censorship of this this song in in uh, that the stage version of it has um, slightly more explicit lyrics, is that um, uh, the, the squirters has <laughs> has remained in. Get your squirters out and we'll squirt the devil's back. Um, squirters, of course, not referring to a, a water pistol, let's put it that way. Um, uh, yes, you're right, Phil. Yeah, uh, licensing hours um, were first introduced in in World War One. Um, so, uh, so the squirters is something that's kind of managed to get its way past past the censor. I don't really want to elaborate on what squirters are, but it's, it, it should be fairly obvious to anybody who's who's drunk a lot of uh, of uh, a larger volume of weaker beer. <laughs> what that is referring to okay so again i'm giving that because as to show you some of the some of the milieu around around uh around music hall and the last thing uh that i'm going to play you is is not a is it is it is a music hall skit it's a, from a little later it's from 1938 um uh, rather than a, a uh rather than a song uh this is from uh billy russell uh, who was uh, you know, quite a, a, a famous comedian in the uh, the interwar years and even into the on into the 1940s uh, as well. Um, and his shtick was, uh, you know, he was the 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 determined old working class chap. Um, uh, so his his entire skit, his entire kind of act, which is about um, you can get hold of it um, because I've just taken a a, a, a snippet uh, f uh, from it. But the entire act is called "On Behalf of the Working Classes." Uh, it's about um, getting on for about twelve, thirteen minutes long. So that was you know, kind of an average sort of length for a, a musical uh, comic um, uh, slot. Um, and uh, you'll get about two minutes of it uh, here. He starts here. Oh, well, I must apologise for the for the kind of the, like the really uh, obvious <laughs> sexism uh, that's uh, included here as well. Um, but uh, I'll give you a bit of a context. I've come into, into this about uh, maybe about a third of the way into, into the, uh, the the full act, and he is explaining to his audience um, that he's just started work on a, on a building site. So uh, that's that's what he's talking about when you first uh, hear him talk. Okay, uh, enjoy as much as you possibly can. I was only saying to our foreman the other day, our foreman, he's a nice fella. I couldn't make him out when I first met him. I thought he was a little bit religious. Somebody had just dropped a paving stone on his foot. <laughs> he was sitting on the edge of the barrow telling God all about it. Well, when I got over to <laughs> When I got over to him, he said, have you got your cards? I said, I wish I'd have known. I'd have brought my dartboard as well. <laughs> he said, you've come to start work, ain't you? I said, yes, that's right. I said, let's get started. I said, how many's working on this job? He said, oh, about half of them. <laughs> I said, well, where's my shovel? He said, you can't have a shovel. I said, I want a shovel. I want something to lean on, same as the other bloke. <laughs> he said, get hold of that barrel. I said, right, oh, what do I do with it? He said, well, you fill it. I said, what with it? He said, cement. I said, yes. 
He said, then on top of the cement you stick two boards and on the two boards you stick 50 bricks. Then you run the old lot up that plank there, along the plank there, take it to that bloke up on the top, he does all the work. <laughs> I said, right, have you got a couple of 56-pound weights knocking about? He said, what for? I said, I'd like to tie them on my ankle so as I shan't break into a gallop. <laughs> I tell you, it's a treat to get home at night, ain't it? I got home the other night, there was my old woman. I wish you could meet my old woman. The greatest mistake of my life. <laughs> Always take her with me everywhere I go. It's a damn sight easier than kissing a goodbye. <laughs> yeah, when I got home the other night, there she was, sat in front of the fire, listening to the wireless. She loves the wireless. That's her amusement. Well, she doesn't get much out of me. You know how it is when you get my age, you soon have half ounce of backer. <laughs> okay, so there we are. That's 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 Billy Russell. Um, uh, the uh, the main reason I, I play you that is. Um, uh, not to kind of like regale you with with um, with uh, sexism, although it is kind of revealing about what was considered to be um, a perfectly uh, normal subject of humour. Uh, but because this is recorded live, and that is uh, until the 1930s and the late 1930s, that's really quite rare to see a live recording of this kind of thing. Um, and it being recorded live makes it especially valuable for historians to judge these kind of um, matters of social history because you can hear the audience's response and the audience's response is variable so some jokes get a, a, a small laugh and some get really quite a big laugh so you can see that kind of pattern of of laughter actually cre creates a sense of what is considered to be more and less funny at the time uh, so he gets a particularly big laugh for the the leaning on the the shovel joke um, <clears throat> and he also gets a, a big laugh um, when he explains right at the end when he explains what he means by um, uh, my wife well you know she doesn't she doesn't get a lot out of me these days uh, and he explains that with his with the uh, you, I'd sooner have a, a half ounce of backer um though so uh, there are there are jokes that really uh have a, a certain level of um of, you know, particular cachet if you like or particular uh, response from the audience and that's kind of kind of revealing to uh, to a historian as well as the kind of just everyday tropes about the the, the british uh, working man being you know uh kind of kind of lazy um and uh but at the same time, uh, having a, a kind of a, a cynical and also somewhat self-deprecating humour. So there's lots of things that you can get out of that type of material. I am now, that's what you've just been listening to, uh, Lloyd George's beer and on behalf of the working classes. Um, that's that's me. Done. You'll be probably pleased to hear since I've overrun by a full 10 minutes. And um, so I'm going to stop the recording in uh, imminently and then we'll have uh, an opportunity as long as you're not too desperate to dash out into the sunshine to have some questions. And thanks very much to uh, the OUHS for for allowing me to to do this uh, piece of um, kind of self-indulgence.